Hello. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Um, I do not want to waste any of our time that we have today, so I'm going to go ahead and get started as we have um, some more participants kind of dwindle in here. It's good to see everyone. I hope everyone is staying safe and warm. And um, today we're talking about, well, Harold is talking about Mendelssohn's Elijah, um, which is super exciting. This is the end of our um, score study for now before we kind of turn to some choral clinics over the next few weeks, which we'll hope you will join us again. We'll give you some more information at the end of today's session as well on that. Since we are a nice large group here, we have put everyone on mute just to avoid any feedback or background noise. So if you need to unmute yourself, please feel free to do so and communicate with Harold. Um, you can just press your space bar down while you speak. That will unmute yourself. And releasing the space bar will mute yourself again automatically. You can also use the, mic the microphone icon in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen uh, if your space bar doesn't work for you. Just please put yourself back on mute once you're done talking with us, just again so that we can avoid any extra background noise. There will be a Q&A at the end of the session tonight. It's open to absolutely everyone. If you've been here before, if you're new today, um, please feel free to um, write your questions down during our session. Harold can um, and loves to answer these questions for you. Even if they're not necessarily about Mendelssohn's Elijah, um, he is a great resource and um, loves to answer questions. So just raise your hand um, or use the raise hand button that Zoom has um, and we can call on you to ask your question. I'll be sending over more information about Harold and about the organization to the chat box right after this. Um, this information includes a donation link. Harold gives all of these sessions free um, to the public. Therefore, any and all donations are greatly appreciated. These donations go to Canticorum Virtuosi Inc., which is a non-for-profit that provides funding for both of Harold's New York-based choirs. And these donations are tax deductible. In the chat box, you will also find my email address. You can use this email to request any technological assistance throughout the session tonight or in the future if you ever have an issues, um, any issues signing up. Lastly, we are recording this session like we do every session, and you will be sent a link to this session with our, the rest of our archive for you to view at your leisure after the session tonight. Those emails usually go out in the morning. Um, and it also includes the link for our choral clinics. We would love to have as many people there as possible. That being said, if you are interested in participating in these choral clinics, um, all it requires is a video submission of you conducting your ensemble, any classical ensemble performing classical repertoire, whether it's band, orchestra, uh, and um, or choir. Um, we would love to see it. And Harold will offer his advice to you in your performance of your ensemble. So just email that submit that video submission to haroldrosenbaum at gmail.com and he can get you set up for one of our choral clinics. All of that being said, I am um, happy to pass the mic over to Harold. Enjoy. Thank you, Karina. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> we have a lot more people who signed up, so either they forgot or they're going to come in. Oh, hi. Okay, but I'm going to start in. Um, so, so this is from a conductor's point of view obviously, since I'm a conductor, um, but just a very little bit of background about this piece. Obviously, it's one of the great oratorios, and uh, it depicts events in the life of the prophet Elijah, as told in the books uh, One Kings and Two Kings of the Old Testament. And it's composed in the spirit of Bach and Handel, who Mendelssohn loved. And I think you all know that uh, it was Mendelssohn who brought Bach's music back after 75 years or so, or 74 years of Bach's music, you know, basically in, in obscurity. And he brought it back by conducting the St. Matthew Passion. He must have known the B minor mass because um, the opening of, of, this, uh, of this oratorio, Elijah, um, reminds me of how Bach um, started his mass in B minor. If you don't know it, I mean, you know, he has, um, I guess it's eight measures, right? And he, the chorus starts right in. The opening sound is the chorus and the orchestra. Kyrie, you know, very slow. Kyrie eleison. And then there's a long orchestral introduction 
very long, maybe a minute or so. And then it leads right into the basses. I guess the basses started. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and then the chorus continues for quite a long time. So just to repeat, um, the it's a very short opening for chorus, long orchestra section, and then a long choral section. Now here, in Elijah, oh, can you put the um, music up on the screen? Yes, one second. So the, the, we're looking at a, um, Oh, do you have the introduction? This should be the introduction here. Well, this is, oh, right. This is a vocal, sorry. She's looking at, I'm looking at a full score. She's looking at the, you're looking at a vocal, you know, score with a piano reduction. So there are four chords, but basically this is a, you know, a section for soloist. Okay, you scroll down and then keep going, keep going, and then keep going. So this is akin to the, B minor mass opening where it's just uh, the chorus and now this is just the soloist go on and now you have the next section oh okay so she doesn't have the big orchestral um, lead in so then you have a big orchestral section um, just the, just the orchestra which is like the B minor mass, and then it leads right into help lower the chorus, which is just like the B minor mass with the Kyrie sung by the whole chorus. It's, I, I, I happen to think he, he modeled this after that. All right, let's go back a minute to the very opening. Okay, see right away, I like to, um, I would like to, when I, when I see this, when I saw the score for the first time, and again, for those of you who are new to these sessions, I don't listen to anybody else's interpretation ever. Once in my life, once out of 1800 concerts, I once listened to a recording of a piece that was brutally difficult. And I was doing the world, uh, world premiere, but I listened to the MIDI, you know, the computer generated performance. Um, so uh, I, I hear this as, dun, dun. Uh, like a rubato right before the second downbeat. I just do. So uh, uh, what I'll be talking about today is, you know, interpretation. And this is the second piece since I began doing these in September that's in English. So I want to talk about the language also. I want to talk about pronunci pronunciation uh, throughout the evening also. And um, one more second. Oh, one more thing I wanted to say is, uh, you know, I, I relate this to the opening of the B minor mass because the, uh, the, the, key, the key signatures are, are similar in a sense. I mean, B minor is the relative major of D major, and this is in D minor. So I just think there's a parallel opening here. Okay. Um, I mean, you have to follow the soloist, but who can take a few a few sort of stretching liberties. In other words, it doesn't have to be exactly metronomic, even though it's not really a, you know, a recitative, because I just don't think, you know, you can call it a recitative accompagnato because the orchestra is there, whatever it is, it's, just, it's an opening statement. And I feel there's, there's um, I feel it, I do feel it more like a recitative even though it's not, even though it's not labeled as such because uh, it's Elijah making his first appearance. As God the Lord of Israel liveth, um, I have a different score, so I'm not sure if my English is the same as yours, but by the, before whom I stand, and when I first uh, conducted, when I conducted this piece, before I conducted it, I met with the soloist and his voice was booming. He had the whole oratorio memorized. It's a great, great singer who I, actually hired over 30 times over 35 years, David Arnold. And I just, I just sort of sat back in, in awe, but you have to keep the beat. That's the thing. You have to keep the beat, even though he might stretch things here and there. But the thing is, that's what rehearsals are for. That's what a piano rehearsal is for, to work that out. You know, where he wants to stretch, where he wants to go a little faster. Okay, 
um, at the Fomata, which is the fifth measure right there, whom I stand, you have to figure out how to proceed as a conductor. Do you give the fourth beat after you cut them off? Whom, I mean, you're not really, okay, wait, you're not really cutting him, yes, you are, you're cutting him off and the orchestra all together. So you have to have a cutoff. I'm looking at the full score and everybody cuts off together here. So then you cut them off, you pause, and then four, you give the fourth beat. He has to look at you, you have to look at him, you have to sense, you know, there has to be communication with you and the soloist for sure. Um, okay, anyway, um, at the very end of this, I uh, scroll down one. Okay, I, I again in measure eleven. Calling to the I feel a sense of a, a rubato or ritardando right before the fermata, as I do with most fermatas in whatever music it is. Um, if the fermata is at the end of a section, I feel like. At least 50% of the time you should slow down, maybe 60% of the time. And then you wait, and then you have to, can you go to the next uh, page? Well, that's the overture, right? The overture is not here. You're not seeing the orchestral overture. But let me talk about diction a minute. If you're working with a, a really experienced soloist, a, really, a professional soloist who's got a career, you don't wanna to mess too much with the way they pronounce things. I mean, for example, if you don't want your, your chorus members to roll R's, especially in, if it's in English, if you don't want them to roll R's, tell them so. But if the soloist rolls some R's, chances are he or she won't roll them all. It, it can work, it can work. I've, I've learned that by listening to Peter Pears, you know, Benjamin Britten's significant other. And uh, yeah, it's, it sounds, it might sound mannered if a young person does it, but um, yeah. And also, you know, I like to have my choruses um, uh, sing so that the um, audience can actually understand the words. Is that too much to ask? To ask, to ask? To wask? Is that too much to wask? No. Is that too much to ask? Notice I use the glottal there. Um, but you know, a lot of soloists don't use glottals, or very many of them. A glottal is when you, you know, uh, vocal cords come together for a fraction of a second, stopping the flow of air. Um, so you have to deal with that. You know, uh, how do you deal with it? Well, you can suggest that they use more glottals. And the younger they are and the more inexperienced they are, the more you can tell them what to do. You know, if you have a college choir and somebody's singing a solo, tell them what to do. Um, but diction is so important right at, the, at the very beginning here, because if you don't sing palaud, the, the second word, I tell them the second word here is palaud. The second word is hell. Hell, palaud, palaud. Otherwise it'll sound like hell, Lord. Hell, Lord. You know, you really have to uh, articulate, enunciate. Wilt thou cry? Um, some of you who are singers, you know this already, but um, young singers on the word quite might, might do something like this. Wilt thou quite, quite? It's a diphthong. The I in the word quite is really ah, followed by an E. And I tell them, hold the first half of the diphthong as long as possible, unlike Frank Sinatra, who would sing strangers in the night, exchanging glances, which is great for that style. But can you imagine, you know, a chorus of 150 people and they're going to the second half of the diphthong in, in all different places. Some are going quite, and some are going quite, and some are going quite, you know, so it's a mess. It's a huge mess. The next thing I want to say is, um, how to pronounce the T in quite and the D in destroy. I like to hear a T and a D. I would have liked to seen a T and a D in the Super Bowl, but that 
that that that team which lost didn't score score any TDs. Oh my God! But that's a whole other story. Anyway, I like quite this, quite this. Now, singers would rather implode the T and go quite this, and really not have it be heard. They say it's easier to do. I say it's harder for an audience to understand that. The next thing is how to pronounce the the E and destroy. Is it I, E, or or schwa? Uh. Quite destroy. I wouldn't go quite destroy. Of course, I made that D sound very nasal to make it uncomfortable sounding, but I still wouldn't. I mean, destroy, destroy. It's not dear. It's a schwa neutral. It's, it's not quite destroy, destroy. Maybe it is. Sometimes, you know, other people tell me, you know, you're wrong. It's not a schwa, it's a I, I, I. But, you know, I don't know. Just, I think it's a schwa, destroy. Destroy. Now, without a glottal, and I'm spending a lot of time on this on this page on, on pronunciation and, and diction. I won't do all that much in following pages, but um, if you don't have a glottal before us, you're going to go, Stroyas, Stroyas. There was a great Roman emperor named George Destroyas. I'm only kidding. Anyway, it's Destroy Us. It's a glottal. Okay. Next. The hope is now is over the heaven. Let's go down one st staff. Okay. The um, yeah. Just go down one more. The pickup tenor, pickup. Um, so in, in this edition we're looking at, is this from CPDL, Karina, or IMSLP? Which one is this from? This Karina. is from CPDL. Yeah. So, you know, anybody can contribute to these things, anybody in the world. So, I mean, in my edition, I have little little hairpins on the high. I have, the harvest now is over, the summer days are gone, and yet no power come. I have a crescendo, decrescendo there. So I'm not sure, you know, whether that my my edition is, um, which is Calmus, which generally, yeah. Which what do you have there, Celeste? Huh? Say it again. The uh, Baron Rider has the weapons. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So maybe, maybe the Calmus. And uh, Twelve and thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. So maybe the Calmus is a reprint of the Baron Rider, but even even if what I like to follow the composer's intentions, and that's a nice thing to do generally, especially here. But again, if you're a conductor, you should sing. You should sing every line of every piece you're conducting and put markings. Is this is this uh, just legato and doesn't require any markings? Let me see. The harvest now is over, the summer days are gone, and yet no power come to help us. It doesn't really require, you know, markings. It's sort of all there if you're singing, if you know how to sing legato. Um, but uh, the question is, do you follow, is, is it marked piano? Yeah, it's marked piano. Each part is marked piano. Does that work? Sometimes you want one part to stand out more than another, um, even though it's not marked. Um, this is pretty easy and free flowing. I would say as far as cueing goes, I'm, I'm, I'm big on cueing with the left hand. A lot of conductors who don't have independent movement with the left hand, they never learned to, to do this. You know, they never learned it. They'll, they'll crescendo by sort of leaning forward and, you know, expanding the whole, both hands and, and sort of like a barbershop co chorus conductor. And, you know, it can actually work at times, but it's really, really, really useful to, to develop the left hand procedures that they're, um, you know, that they're designed for. So for example, after the tenor, we'll go, to, go down to the next system. Yeah, so stop there, stop, stop, stop. So here's the ending of the tenor. It's the third measure on the page. Watch what I do. If you can see, I'll step back a little bit. 
I'll raise my hand. Usually it would be way down, but because of the camera angle. So here's the last measure on top. So, because soprano, two, three, alto, tenor. So I gave the soprano cue on the downbeat and one, two, three. On the fourth beat, I give the alto and on the downbeat, I give the tenor. So to, to uh, repeat that, starting from the top of the page, third measure, dun, 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 to soprano, two, three, alto, tenor, and you have to rotate. You have to swivel, which is why you should stand with your feet apart. Some conductors stand with their feet together and, uh, you know, um, it, it's, it's like it, you're not grounded if you do that. You should be able to swivel and turn and use your both legs. Um, yeah, so the cueing is important. People like to see cueing. Even my professionals and my professional chorus, they love it when I cue. You know, there's always somebody who might space out and they'll, they like cueing. Um, so give as much as you can give the cues and, and, and also give the swells. So let me go back um, in my score there and in Celeste's score, uh, there's, uh, let me see, hold on a second. Oh, can you go up a little bit? No, 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 stay down. Um, so in the soprano in measure 13, besides getting ready to do the alto cue, you have to give a crescendo to the sopranos on their fourth beat, be no, on their fourth note before you abandon them and bring the altos in. So here's the soprano part. So one and two and three and four. Then you abandon the concept. You don't have to do the decrescendo. You can't necessarily do the decrescendo unless you really try really hard. Dun, 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 dun. But immediately uh, after giving the beginning of the decrescendo, you give the alto cue. So whatever's happening, whatever should stand out, you should, you should, um, Bring out. Let's go to the next movement. Oh wait. Okay, that's good. That's good. So this is a duet. Uh, yeah. Well, it's the chorus. The chorus starts, and then you have a, a duet solo. It's is it marked? Yes, yeah, soprano solo, alto solo. Okay. So how do you start the movement? Nothing happens. I'm looking at the full score. Absolutely nothing happens. Uh, in other words, there are no instruments at all until the chorus comes in. And no, 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 no. Until the soloists come in in the fourth, the fourth full measure. So you have the uh, altos and sopranos together singing, Lord, bow thine ear to my prayer. It's in two, four time. And they come in on the second beat. So you have to be careful to simply do this. One, go down. A lot of people, a lot of young conductors especially, find it difficult just to go down. <coughs> when you're in, let's say four, four time and the entrance is on the second beat, or if you're in two, two time and the, and the entrance is on the second beat, the prep gesture is the first beat and it goes simply down. So let me move back so you can see. Let me angle this better. So it's one. Lord, bow thine ear to my prayer. Oh, and it's also it's for Sando. Yeah, so you have to give a little accent. So it's so you can you can prepare for that accent by not just going one. You might want to go one, like a little bit of, of a jolt of, of a jerking motion, one. Dun, 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 dun. And then you can bring the um, bass and tenors in, but I would cut off the sopranos and altos. Why not? I mean, what else am I doing at the moment? I mean, am I answering phone calls or something? I mean, just, you know, if you can handle more than one thing at the same time. Hey, Brana, you recognize this room I'm in? <laughs> just hold your space bar down. Hold your space bar. Are you talking to me? No, Brana, not Bree. Sorry. Oh, Brana. Brana. Never mind. It's a, it's no, a, where, I can't I can't really tell where you are. I'm in where you came with us. Oh, okay. Okay. Goodbye. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
because I've given lectures in three different locations in the past three weeks. Anyway, um, yeah, why not give the cut the entrance and the cutoff so it's one. Dun, 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 dun. Entrance cutoff, you know. Dun, dun, dun. Then you bring in the orchestra in and the and the soloist, everybody. Um, the question is, I, I get sometimes is you know, is the conducting style different when you're working with a chorus and orchestra or band? Well, I mean, besides the fact that most orchestral conductors use a baton and most choral conductors don't, I don't think so. When I was first studying conducting, my teacher was telling me, you know, yeah, there are some differences. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. But he was basically a theorist, Saul Novak. I don't know if anybody knows the name. I actually believe he was a, if my memory serves me, Rick Hyman might know this, wasn't he? He was a descendant of Novakowski. So Saul Novak, Novakowski, the great um, European 19th, 19th century composer of Jewish music. But he would say, Saul would say, you know, there's a little different, I don't see it. Uh, if you think about it, if you're conducting an opera, you're conducting an orchestra, the soloists and the chorus, it's the same, you know, it's the same technique. Now, well, let me digress for a minute because I've been watching videos of, um, this week I was watching a lot of videos of Martha Auger, Augerich, I don't know how you pronounce it, Auger, Auger, Augerich, the great Argentinian pianist, my God, a lot of videos. And a lot of the conductors, you know, these are the conductors of the great orchestras and they can get away with things, conducting with like this, like that, you know. But let's see them in front of a school group, a college group, or an amateur choir, and it would be complete mayhem. So I like my conductor, my conducting students to practice, practice, practice conducting gestures. Um, here's a technical thing. Let's go down. Um, let's go down a little bit. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Stop for a minute. Oh yeah. In the third measure on the bottom. So come through it. So the, the top, the soprano soloist sings, neither help nor comfort. Nor, and she has to take a quick breath after comfort. Obviously. What do you do with the alto soloist? I mean, what does she do? Does she also cut that note short? Or does she linger and make that a full eighth note? I think she should cut it short for sure. I think, you know, there's just so much a composer can put in the music or would want to put in the music. It would sound really strange, I think, to have the alto hold that like a tenth of a second longer. But there are times when I do like that to happen, but just not here. You know, it's like detective work. You really have to take every piece on its own merit. Um, okay, let's uh, let's go to the next movement. We can't possibly do all like forty movements. The next ah, you people. This is a very famous aria following this recitative. Uh, again, this is with orchestra, the recitative. So you have to conduct it. But you know, you'll notice that the uh, it's, it's all strings. It's violins, viola, cello, and bass. It's all strings here. You have to conduct it, but it, it's even called a recitative. You don't see it, but in my score, it says recitative. Accompagnato, which means it's not just basso continuo, it's with instruments. So, I'm going to, let's say for a moment, there was a situation where I had absolutely no rehearsal with the soloist, which is which has never happened before in my life. But what happened, you know, was something similar, a situation where you, the, the soloist got sick and somebody had to come in at the last minute. I've had that happen. And you're conducting and you're basically following him, but he just learned this like overnight. So he, he may rush, he can make a, instead of, Ye people rend your heart. He might go, ye people rend, and then you have to just follow him. 
you have to just rush and drag and just follow him because you know the, the players they need to see you conducting beats because the chord changes in the second measure on the on the third beat for the upper three strings they change notes so they, you have to conduct this but when you conduct it now let's go back to a typical scenario forget the sickness and the last minute replacement what you want to do is you don't you don't want to do this that's crazy. You want, this is what you want to do. Minimal, minimal conducting because you're not really conducting. It's a recitative. You, you know what I mean? You're not really doing anything except beating time for the strings sake. You're not shaping anything. You know, there's no reason to have a giant gesture here. That's what I wanted to say about this. Um, yeah, now the next movement. Oh, this is the famous aria. If with all your heart you truly seek me. Now, diction. I'm telling you, I've heard performances, not necessarily of this piece, but other pieces with similar words in that fifth measure, you know, seek me. I'm telling you, um, if you don't have good diction, you're gonna, you're gonna hear, Hearts ye truly seek me, see me. So instead of seek me, come me, me. You know, that's that last word should be. I often say, say to my like college choruses, for example, let's say the piece starts with two notes, seek, seek me. I tell them, what's the first word? They say seek. I say, no, the first word is see, and the second word is come me. Ah, they say, ah, seek me. It really helps to think of it that way. And sometimes I even uh, have them cross out the K. I mean, here they're very close to each other, but if, if let's say seek what were a half note and there's more space in between the two words, I would have them cross out the K and put it right next to the, right before the M. And certainly on the end of the system, if you had an S, the syllable, the letter S, at the end of a system, I tell them cross it out and put it on the next on the next system. It really helps. It's a okay um, balance. So you have to balance out, um, you know, the the chorus on the orchestra, the soloist, the chorus. I mean, the balance is a, a major element when you're. No matter how much you study the score, you in in practicality, you have to tone the orchestra down or you know like especially trombones but there are no trombones yet not here but there wasn't the first there were in the first movement trombones like to play too loud um there was an article in one of the newspapers today that the piccolo players um in orchestras because of covid uh, you have to be careful not to sit close in front to a piccolo player because um they project more than six feet, you know, the air. So, in, well, in Europe, they have barriers. They've had this for many years. When Remember when in Europe, they had a, um, a new law that you couldn't go above, orchestras couldn't play above a certain decimal level, decibel level. Um, but they, that's when they started putting those, um, or maybe they started before then, maybe it's a whole different subject, but the, they, they put partitions in front of the trombone players in between the brass and the and the woodwinds because it was just too loud in their ears. Anyway, back to balance. Um, you have to keep the orchestra down here. If you have a lyric tenor, not a Heldon tenor, you just have to subdue them. It is marked pianissimo, but that you know pianissimo means something different for different people. Um, now, um, interpretively, if you have a high school orchestra, for example. And there's some very good ones, you know, there's some good college orchestras, very good. Um, and some of you probably play a string instrument, you know a lot more about this than I do, but the, the, fifth, the fifth and sixth notes in the first measure, obviously they're slurred together, but more than that, I don't think they would hold the eighth note to the downbeat. I don't think they would go da 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 da. I think they go da, 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 like a space in between. It's just something that you know to be aware of 
in case you don't know these things and you start hearing that kind of thing happening, it's the bowing, they're changing directions of the bow. Let's go to the next choral, choral movement. Actually, the next movement is a choral movement. This is a great aria, if with all your hearts, in case you don't know it. Okay. Um, yet doth the Lord see it not. He mocketh us at us. So um, the strings are the whole the strings are it's forte. But what you have to decide as a as a conductor is is it legato, is it poco marcato, or is it marcato or staccato? Yet doth the Lord see it not, yet doth the Lord. I don't see, I don't hear that as legato. Yet doth the Lord see it. It's not lyrical, it's not tender. It's definitely, um, uh, you know, dramatic. He mocketh, I have printed staccatos on he mocketh. You don't have that in your score, but your score is done by somebody who knows from where, and it's, it just doesn't have the, the basic stuff. And I, I have to believe that Mendelssohn put the staccatos in on. He mocketh at us. Make sure that S comes on the downbeat. Um, and the other question is how, how short is, how short are the staccatos? Well, at this tempo, there's not much choice. He mocketh at, really short. You don't wanna make them like, eighth notes and eighth rest. He mocketh, he mocketh at us. So at a slower tempo, like sometimes you'll see uh, in a slower tempo in, in uh, different pieces, you might see uh, a quarter note staccato, like a series of quarter notes which have staccatos above it. And it's tough to know like, exactly how short to make it. I, I generally make them half value but you might even want it shorter than that. It's, it's, these are some of the things you have to think about. Um, yeah, let's look at the, um, the soprano. Let's go forward a little bit. The, uh, yeah, right there at the, the end. His curse hath, right? Um, now, the sopranos have to breathe after us. Unlike before, when we, we were talking about the soprano alto duet and I had the alto breathing with the soprano. What are you gonna do? You're gonna cut the lower three parts off with the soprano, that's crazy. The, you're making the soprano us an eighth note. You can have the, the bottom four make, keep their half note length. That's fine. Um, now, even though it's forte and accented, look at that line and then scroll down, Karina, to the next page. His curse hath, go on, go on, go on. His curse hath fallen down among us. The question is, do you want us to be the same volume as pawn? Well, one side of me says, it's all very dramatic. Falling down, falling down upon us, perhaps. But if you would want to speak this, his curse hath fallen down upon us. Us would be the weakest syllable if you were to speak it. So there's something to say for upon us, relinquishing the volume there. It's a little decrescendo. I don't think you want a subito piano, but you want a little decrescendo. Then the next question is how, when should the decrescendo start? Should it be a four, a four beat decrescendo? Should it start on the third beat and go for two beats? Should it, be, should it start on the fourth beat and go for one beat? These are things you have to think about as a conductor. And then you have to also think about whether uh, the, uh, once you land on us, you should taper off even more to allow the basses to really be heard. I very often say to choristers, come away, not, not necessarily in, in this case, but generally speaking, come away to the last note, but not through the last note. But there are exceptions to all rules. And here you might want to have like a two, a two measure decrescendo, I don't know, or no decrescendo. These are the things you have to think about. And then the one part comes in after another. So you have to cue them all. Basses, three, oh, it's in um, 
one, two, three, in fa, and then one, two, three, altos, one, two, three, and fa, tenors, one after another. Cues, really. People ask me, what's more important to give cues or cutoffs? I would say cues, if you have to decide. Because when you're going from one to another, and you have a series of cues, you, you know, it's more important to bring them in or else they won't be able to cut off because they never came in, you know, let them and cut them off when you can, but there's a lot to do. Um, yeah, the question is, is the whole thing dramatic like that or is it, does it become legato at some point? It's up to you. You have to look at the text and figure it out. Can we go way ahead to the end of this movement? I never keep track of time. What time is it, Karina? It is 7.40. Aha, uh -huh, we have time. Now go back, now this is where Bach comes in again. He, he loved the Bach chorales, you know? So, for he is the Lord our God. Um, could go, yeah, go back. Oh no, go ahead. No, I don't know where you are, because we have no measure markings in your score. Here we are. Keep going, that's keep going, keep going. Um, no, go down. He will destroy us. Stop. I mean, stop, you know, the music stops. Grave, grave. So everything stopped. Uh, us off. When you cut everybody off on the top of the page, destroy us. You have to think ahead. If, the, if you were here, I'd show you my score. Um, okay. They're coming in. Hold on a second. This next section is in two. I don't know if this first fast section was in two or not. Let me just look way back. Yeah, cut time. Okay, it was cut time. This is boom, fast. This whole section is in two. Now, this next section is also in two. So there's a lot of activity happening before this. His wrath will pursue us till he destroy us, till he destroy us off. Where do you want your right hand to be when you cut them off? If you're over here, if you go one, two, off, you're in trouble. Because the next thing you have to do is give a downbeat because they come in on two, one. Four, see that? One, four. So, destroy us off. Why not one, two, off? One, so it's down. Second beat is here, the rebound is here. And then do a circle in the sky or an oval and you're in position to go one. See, and this is the same thought process you have to do for, for, for matas, you know, like, like the very next one, for example. It's completely different here. So, one, for he the Lord our God. Now, God is on the downbeat. The cutoff should be another downbeat, like this. Instead of like that, like last time, now it's off. It's a, a circle, a circle, a circle, stop the circle, halfway through, do a half circle, go straight down. Like that. But you can do a circle with your left hand at the same time. It gets very complicated, but this is what, you asked to be a conductor, so you have to, well, maybe you didn't, but this is what happens. The left hand can do a complete circle, God, and the right hand does this. So the right hand gives the downbeat. It's like this, one, and they come in on two. So the right hand goes one, two. It's like um, six o'clock, five o'clock, four o'clock, three o'clock, two o'clock, one o'clock on the clock, 12 o'clock straight down, half circle, one, while the left hand gives a complete cover, complete circle. Six o'clock, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, one, two, three, four, five, six, one. This is what you have to practice as a conductor, which I love doing. 
I used to do it on the subway. People thought I was crazy. Well, I am crazy, but they really, they would tell people, I saw Harold on the subway, he was, I didn't want to get near him. I thought he was losing it. All right, anyway, that's like when I was taking, when I had kidney stones and I was 26 and I, was, I went to a, uh, a doctor, he gave me 76 pills a day to take. So I would take a tray, an ice tray on the subway. And before lunch, I would take 12 pills out and these guys surrounded me. Hey man, what do you get? Hey, you got, give me some of those drugs, you know? Okay, anyway, um, <laughs> that's a true story. <laughs> I said, no, these are my pills of my health pills. Um, okay. Then a little bit about the text. For he, the Lord, our, our God, shadow vowel, God, there, if you sing God, if you go God, it sounds like a T, unless you do a shadow vowel, God, actually it's A flat, A flat, God, God, just make believe you're in Italy, God, he is, a, I'm telling you, professional singers alike, amateurs and professionals will, will always go, he is a, is a, is a. I knew a girl named Izzer in high school. Forget that. He is a, it's a glottal. You can do it. You can sing legato and, and, and do glottals, you know. It's absolutely possible. And it has to do with line, creating a nice line. It has to do with how you would speak it. In other words, he is you know, you might say he is, a, but in this case, he is a jealous God. So a uh, is the next to the weakest syllable. O-U-S is the weakest. He, it's like on a, on, a, on a volume meter. He is a jealous God. So if, o, if the word a, a uh, is soft, he is a, uh, do, do a soft, a gentle uh, glottal. You don't want to go, you don't want to go, he is a, you know, because you can, you can hurt yourself if you do heavy, you know, glottals year after year. And he visiteth. Now, it's not visiteth. It's like good people sing the, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people sing the word good, G O O D N E S S, goodness. I mean, Al Capone didn't think Elliot Ness was so good, but he arrested him on tax evasion. I know you've heard this before, Brana. Don't worry about it. Um, he, it's visiteth. It's visiteth. It's not visiteth. I mean, come for ye, come. For, I mean, maybe that's different because maybe in England they, it's accepted, but you know, things like that. Come for ye, comfort. Okay, I needed to say that because that's so prevalent. How do you do father's sins? That's a tricky one. Do you actually do two S's? Maybe not. Maybe the altos do because they have time to do that. Father, well, it's grave anyway. Actually, the whole thing is grave. So everybody's got time to do. Father's sins, for sure. Fa soprano, father's sins, not father sins. Whose father sins? It completely changes the meaning. You know, there's time to do that. If it were much faster, I would say maybe not, but you can actually do a, a longer S, start the S sooner. Let's say this was fa, let's say this were father's sins, but you can't go father's sins. You can't put two S's there. If it's a little slower, father's sins or father's sins, you put an elongated S more than you would normally, and that covers both S's, both printed S's. These are details you have to definitely be careful about. Um, let's go on hey, a little hey. bit. Yeah. Harold, we, yeah. we are at our 10 minute mark. Do we want to see if anyone has questions now? And if not, we can keep going. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Okay. If you do, just give us a hand raise and we'll make sure we get to you. And if not, we'll just move on with a few more movements. No. Oh, yes, yes Howard, how, go ahead. 
Oh, I had a question at the very beginning. You mentioned something about cueing with your left hand, but avoiding um, kind of a barbershop look. What did you mean by that? You don't want you, you want to cue with two hands or you want to independently cue with one hand? Good question. You want to cue with the left hand. You want here the left hand has five functions. Crescendo, decrescendo, cueing, cutting off, and fermata. Even though the right hand has, has a play in, with fermata also. You, the right hand, I mean, look, there, as I said, there are exceptions to all rules. There are times when um, you might want to cue with the right hand. Let's say you're, a, a, when I conducted the Haydn's, Haydn's creation in Carnegie Hall, I had the three soloists on my right. The stage was so full and they were way on my right and the violins were way on my left. And I would sometimes mirror conduct and cue, the, cue them with my right hand, the soloists, things like that. But that's an exception. The basic notion is not to do what barbershop uh, directors do. And I, I admire them. I love barbershop music. I had my own barbershop quartet in college. My brother, you know, yeah, big time barbershop, but they don't, and they, they shouldn't. They're not trained to, to do that. They train. They give a crescendo like this. They lean forward. Goodbye, my Coney Island, baby. You know, and that that, that can work for barbershop music. But um, this one piece I told you, this world premiere of this three hour piece I did in Avery Fisher Hall with too little rehearsal, and the trumpets. There was maybe five minutes where the trumpets weren't playing, and we only had a chance to go through this one particular beastly movement once before the concert. And the, afterwards they thanked me for bringing them in. So I think cueing is really wonderful. And it's not just the, the fact that you are bringing them in, it's how you do it. You know, because no matter how you rehearse in performance, some, you know, energy takes over and some feeling of, you know, the adrenaline takes over. So, I mean, there, there are many different ways to cue. You know, there's, there's the finger, there's the palm up, there's a more gentle cueing, which is like, if I'm conducting, um, and Kayla, is that the pronunciation of your name? Kayla, well, Kay, I'm gonna give Kayla um, something, we'll talk, but uh, Ave Verum Corpus by Bird, B-Y-R-D, I think that's the piece I wanna give you for next time. and. Um, sometimes a piece is so gentle that you can't bring them in like this, or even like this, you want to just sort of turn and raise your eyebrows and just go like that. But that's down the road. You know, I, I, when I teach conducting, I, you know, like, uh, I teach the, the basics. Once you get the basics down, see, Leonard Bernstein never got, never got the basics down. Am I being critical of Leonard Bernstein? Of course not. One of the greatest geniuses of the 20th century. And he, he's the favorite of every major, you know, orchestral player in the world when he was alive. But he self-admittedly, he didn't have a, a standard technique. And it was a sort of a strange, you know, technique, but it worked for him because he worked with all the great ensembles. Uh, but it's important to get the basics down because most of us are not gonna be working with world-class ensembles. Any, uh, I answered your question and then some. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I don't know if I answered it well. You did, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Celeste. Celeste. I know you say you don't listen to um, recordings for comparison, but um, in preparation, do you compare uh, different editions or do you just go with one particular edition that you may, that you used well, to? Well, that's a very, very good question. I, I try to seek out the most um, scholarly edition or, or the Urtek, Urtek. As I have the, the um, for example, with Bach, I like to get editions like the Baron Rider, the, you know, like the full score, no, the complete works in libraries, you know, Bach Gesellschaft, which has no editor. I like to have Baroque pieces unedited. 
classical pieces, you know, like by Mozart, they'll have dynamics and other things in them, but the, the fewer ed editorial markings, the better. I don't want to purchase scores for my choir, which have an editor's markings in it, because I, I never agree with editors 100%. I told the story about uh, David Randolph, one particular piece I loved his markings, but I, I never ever agree with editors more than 50% even. Um, sometimes you have no choice with what edition. I once ordered, I did the uh, American premiere of a piece by uh, Luciano Berrio, and I did two, Amer two American premieres. Uh, Conti Canticum Novissimi Testamenti with my Canticum Novum singers, uh, coincidentally. And you rented the parts from a European American. I rented the parts. I think it was $450 to, to rent 16 vocal scores. That's it, it was a cappella. And it was in his handwriting, it wasn't engraved. And it was terribly inaccurate and difficult to read. I spent I remember four and a half hours at home, like correct, you know, making things clearer. But, but these singers, they, they asked me questions in rehearsal. Is this an F? Is this an E? Is it a half note? I couldn't get everything down. And I refused to pay the bill when they sent me an invoice. That's the only, I, I refused because it cost me money to waste the time in rehearsal. Explain. But that's uh, not, not a common occurrence. Thea Musgrave, I think, has some pieces published in her handwriting, but it's a, it's a beautiful handwriting. Yes, Celeste. Well, I, I asked because the, um, that phrase, he mocketh at us in the Baron Rider uh, has no staccatos. And so that to me would, if I were looking at that, my Baron Rider score, I would think of that as your individual interpretation. Yeah. Well, at that tempo, an accent would be staccato, it seems to me. He huh. mock, well, not really. He marketh that. You know, as a conductor, you can hear it more than one way. That's, you know, <laughs> oh, there's so many ways, and you have to demonstrate to the group. Well, that's why I was wondering um, if you compared editions because I know you, you take great stock in the Baron Rider, as many of us do. We look for that gorgeous blue cover, and yeah. you know, it's like an emblem of uh, authenticity and, and research. Um, but yeah. again, uh, because you, interpreted it one way and I'm reading it differently. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you, you took more than one edition and just, you know, compared editions. I don't, I don't really do that. I mean, I, I sometimes you just rent from one company because they're a little cheaper or purchase. I mean, I want to avoid Calmus as much as possible because I remember once I ordered a full score of a Handel Oratorio cost me $90 for the full score and the, and the parts. I owed the whole thing. And I opened the full score and the binding just fell apart right away, you know. So I try to avoid Calmus. They're based in Florida. They have alligators there walking around. I mean, really. <laughs> what are they doing down there? I don't know. Too much sun. Uh, are, there are there any last questions? We've got two minutes now. Um, want to make sure that if anyone does have any questions from today's session that they're that they are answered. We're going to have something quite different starting next week and, and uh, going to six weeks. Um, which is, as you know, it's on the schedule. Uh, I'm going to be critiquing conductors and their ensembles. Um, it's going to be an interesting thing we're going to have. Uh, you're going to be able to see uh, a YouTube, well, videos that people have submitted to me, but if they don't have videos of themselves conducting, then I'm going to ask them uh, uh, to conduct a piece that I'll choose ahead of time and they can, uh, you can hear it while they conduct and then I'll, we'll just critique the conductor as opposed to the ensemble and the conductor if somebody sends me a tape of them conducting something like a school choir. Yes, Maria. Um, Make sure. And I was wondering, getting if you don't mind getting back to Elijah, if you have any pointers, because I've used this sometimes as a as an audition piece um, of doing, because I, I I'm a liturgical uh, musician, cantor, pianist, organist. 
uh, as a singer, uh, the alto aria, O oh, Rest in the Lord. Do you have any pointers on that? Oh, sure. Now, what key is that in? Is that in it's C in, major? in C major, yeah. Oh, rest in the you know, as I'm thinking of it, I'm just thinking how I'd love to sing it the way I would speak it. So, for example, the second phrase, um, oh, rest in love. the first phrase goes, there's an arch, right? Yeah, um, so, very definitely. Um, but maybe, you, but, you know, if you were to speak it, you would sing, oh, rest in the Lord. Oh, thank you. Boy, look at the magic. Wow. That was fast. Was Serena doing her magic. This was there. truly magical that I actually have this one because this one is <laughs> way later than I knew it would get to. But okay, okay let, me, let me let me talk about this a little bit. I'm, I'll be happy to. Oh, thank um, you. I mean, you know, oh, oh, rest in the Lord, in the Lord. So, oh, so a typical, you know, young singer might go, oh, rest in the Lord instead of. Oh, rest in the Lord, like lean on Lord, you know? Okay. And then even before that, um, I think of the Wizard of Oz. If you sing, oh, rest in, if you sing, oh, rest tin. Oh. I, the, I would like to hear, oh, rest in, like a T and then a little glottal. Uh-huh. Oh, rest uh -huh. in the Lord. And here again, you don't want to ride the waves. You don't want to ride the crest of the waves, which means you don't want to sing, generally speaking, not just here. You don't want to sing the highest notes louder just because they're higher on the staff. So you don't want to sing, wait patiently for him. Uh huh. If they did that, I would, I would just raise my right hand and say five, you know, five, for him, five him. It's silly. <laughs> wait patiently for him. Yeah. And patience, uh, patient, the second syllable should be a schwa and not an e. Oh, patience, a schwa. Hmm. Yeah. And he shall give thee thy heart. Uh, after a long note uh, in relation to, okay, wait, let me start again. Thee, thy, see thee, thy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, People tend to sing an eighth note louder than the quarter note, especially on a weak beat, just, just because. I don't know why, they just do. And there are disadvantage here because thee is with mouth almost closed and thy is mouth open. So a lot mm. of people might go, give thee thy, instead of give thee the. thy heart. Like don't punch out thy. Don't punch mm -hmm. out thy. Give thee, you might even put a little hairpin on thee. Give thee thy heart. Now here, here you have to decide if you want desire or do. In this case, where yeah, uh, in this case mm. where the word can go both ways, like I desire, I desire. But when you when you have the the, the schwa on a, a a slow quarter note, then I would like an e. Mm. Not, my heart is instead of this, there's something. Oh yes, quite right about having a schwa for a whole second. Well, I can go on forever with this, but uh, I gave you some ideas. Just sing Thank it. Thank you. you. You're welcome. Just sing it beautifully. Sing it the way you would speak it and emote. Um, it's it's another f famous aria from Elijah. It's oh, yeah. I call it deceptively simple. Would you it's agree? Like all of Mozart. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It's easy to sing. It's lyrical. You, but you have to be. Yeah. You have to be uh, musical about it. Very. Yeah. Harold, we actually did have one last question. Do you Do you have time? Yeah. Um. Do you Let have any say, comments? This is from Timothy Brown. Do you have any comments on oh. Elijah translation? Who me? Can you hear, Can you hear me? Yes. And if Timothy, if you no, want to unmute yourself and and ask further, you may. That's the question. What what traditions are better a, than why? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll be quiet. Say that again, please. Which translations do you prefer and why? Uh, okay. Mendelssohn wrote this piece both in German and in English. So um, 
it's unusual for that to happen, but he wrote an English version as well as a German version. So um, did not I don't know if there are, I, I'm not, a, I haven't researched to see if there are different editions with different English words, then I would have to say, you know, there's one set of words that are his and somebody messed it up and did something else for some reason. I don't know. Did he actually speak English? He, he, well, he must have. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Mendelssohn could write in English very well. I mean, he was multilingual, you know, I mean, he could, uh, he had a strong classical background of, you know, Latin, Greek, and also, you know, he's English. Yeah. He was strong. Yeah. No, unlike Handel. I mean, Handel's English was terrible. So, for unto us a child is born. <laughs> and other things like that. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. It's been, it's been such a pleasure to have you. Thanks for staying a few minutes over with us as well. Uh, again, we are doing about six weeks of these choral clinics. Um, oh, actually, uh, it, start, it started out as choral clinics, but now we're making it any, excuse any me. ensemble. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Any ensemble, just make sure it's classical repertoire. If that's an issue, just reach out to us and we'll come up with a, a solution for you. Um, and, um, you know, and, and if you're not an ensemble director yourself, but you know someone that might be interested, just send them our way. We would greatly appreciate it. Um, but make sure you sign up. We'll oh, still be having our, him. we'll be having all of our, um, you know, regular attendees, op the slots open um, for everyone to watch and hopefully gather some information from our peers. So it's, it's, it's very exciting. If you have submitted a, a video and you want to invite some colleagues or friends to, to view, um, then you can also send them to our sign up link and they're welcome to join us. And so I, thank you all so much. Idea, another, one more thing, I, another idea I had is if we don't have over the weeks enough uh, pieces to uh, critique, then uh, we can have like stump, stump the conductor. You can come with a, a score I've never seen and asked me to interpret it on the spot. It might be fun. So Kayla, I'll get back to you tonight or tomorrow about what I talked about. And thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye. Thank everyone. you, Harold. Thank you, everybody. Good night.